Today I'm going to be talking about the Pentateuch, and an obvious question to ask is, what is the Pentateuch? And the Pentateuch is that part of the Bible, the first five books, which are referred to as uh, the Torah in Judaism, and sometimes they're referred to as the five books of Moses, and that makes things rather interesting when it comes to talking about their authorship. Uh, if one speaks a language such as German, uh, in which one usually refers to these books as simply the books of Moses, then talking about whether Moses wrote the books of Moses can seem like you're just creating trouble where there need not be any. But in fact, the tradition that Moses was the author um, is one that comes in rather later. And there are two sets of things that need to be said about the authorship of the Pentateuch. One is noting internal evidence that suggests that the question of authorship needs to be answered differently. Not necessarily in the sense that there may not have been a Moses and he may not have written some things, but at least in the sense that the final version of these books has to be dated later and attributed to someone else at a later time. That's one prong in the two prongs that need to be taken into account when approaching this topic. The other is the evidence within the text that other hands were at work. Let's consider the problems with traditional authorship first. Right? And there are a number of them, and I'll just go through them, uh, hopefully rather quickly. There are numerous anachronisms. There are numerous things which don't seem to fit positing Moses as the author. Right? First of all, Moses is always referred to in the third person. Right? And so the most natural way of understanding the language of the Pentateuch is that when Moses is mentioned, someone else is writing about Moses. And so the books that are traditionally attributed to Moses mention him writing. And whether he wrote some of those things that these books say that he wrote is a separate question. But these are books about Moses writing. And that's not the same thing as Moses writing these books. Moses is referred to in the third person. It's been asked, and I think it's a fair question, even if it's a somewhat amusing one, whether Moses would have written that he is the most humble of men, the humblest man on earth. That's what we find in Numbers 12.3. It reminds me of the joke about a person who was given a prize, a badge, an award for being the humblest person in his church by his pastor, and then the next Sunday the pastor took it away because he wore it. We wouldn't expect somebody who actually is humble to describe himself this way, this way. Whoever wrote about Moses' death seems to write in the same style as the rest of Deuteronomy and later books. That's Joshua through Second Kings. And so it's sometimes been suggested that you know, Joshua or someone else finished off the book. But the style is consistent with much of the rest of the Pentateuch and also matches things that carry on and tell much, much later stories. How and why, if Moses is in fact the author of the whole thing, would he recount his own death and burial in the past tense? Right? And one shouldn't give any credence to the people who will come and say, well, you know, if you reject Moses' authorship, it's only because you won't accept prophecy. Right? This is writing about Moses dying in the past tense. It's not about predicting Moses' death. And so it, there's a shell game, a bit of bait and switch there when people try and suggest that it's about rejection of prophecy or something like that. People who believe in the possibility of prophecy still don't think Moses wrote this because that's not what the text says. That's not what, it's not the impression that the text gives. At the end of Deuteronomy, it says, Never since has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses. If immediately after watching this lecture or listening to it, you say, never since have I heard a lecture as good as that one, it's really not saying anything, right? Unless time has passed and you've heard others. This sounds like an assessment made after other prophets arose. These are significant instances, but they're not the most significant, right? Genesis has references to, at that time, right, the time that the story is set in, the Canaanites were in the land. 
at the time when Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy, the Israelites are not in the land. It's only the Canaanites who are in the land, um, and perhaps you know, a smattering of other people. And so, whoever wrote these phrases wrote at a time long after the time of Moses. And obviously one can say, you know, perhaps this is, these are comments by a later editor. That's entirely possible. But we can only date these texts in their present form, in the final form which we have them, as early as the earliest possible date that fits the evidence within the texts. And so here we're clearly dealing with a time much later than the time of Moses. It's a good historical question whether we can find earlier sources within these texts, and we will, in fact, discuss that. What we're talking about now is the fact that the final form of these books cannot have come from Moses. The texts themselves, the evidence within the Bible itself, suggests otherwise. And if you refuse to accept that, then presumably you give more credence to the tradition of authorship outside the Bible than to the Bible itself. More evidence. Uh, there are passages which refer to the lands east of the Jordan as beyond the Jordan, uh, reflecting the perspective of people within the land. Of course, that region comes to be known as Transjordan, the land beyond the Jordan, but that reflects the perspective of people living in the land. Genesis refers to a list of Edomite, Edomite kings, kings who ruled over Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. And so the author knows of kings who reigned over the Israelites. And in Deuteronomy 2.12, it says that the Horites used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, drove them out. They destroyed the Horites from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did in the land the Lord gave them as their possession. And so the author of Deuteronomy knows of the conquest of the land by the Israelites, as well as other people doing something similar. Deuteronomy repeatedly uses the phrase, to this day, again suggesting that a significant amount of time has passed between what is being recounted and the author's time. And there are other instances that suggest something similar. And so all of this points quite clearly to these texts being from a later time than the time of Moses. And if we ask when, we'd probably have to acknowledge that there are some instances referring to the people having been expelled from the land. And one of those last instances, right, of the use of as it is this day, or to this day, refers to the Israelites being expelled from their land, exiled. And so, that suggests a time of writing, a time of putting these texts in the form in which we now have them during the Babylonian exile, right, long after the time of Moses. Turning to internal evidence, within the Bible itself, we also find evidence of gradual expansion of the Pentateuch. In Joshua 24, 26, right, we have reference to Joshua writing in the book of the law of the Lord. That's not necessarily any work that is in the Pentateuch in the sense of one of the books of the Pentateuch, right, Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, but it does suggest that the collection of laws goes on being expanded for some time. This seems to continue well into the time of the period immediately before the monarchy, if not indeed during the monarchy. Samuel is depicted as writing up stipulations regarding the kingship, and those bear comparison to what we find in Deuteronomy. If the laws in Deuteronomy already existed in Samuel's time, then we wouldn't expect those things to be written, right? And so even internally to the Bible, there's evidence of ongoing writing of laws, ongoing writing of commandments, ongoing writing of things that would contribute to the Pentateuch. As I suggested, most scholars think that the date of final completion is in the exilic or post-exilic period. Scholars talk about sources underlying the Pentateuch, and before we talk about what those hypothetical sources are, we might do well to note that there's explicit evidence within the Bible for the use of sources. Right? And so passages like the ones that are up on the screen in Numbers, in Joshua, Second Samuel, 
they're references to writings, right? They're not writings that correspond to text that we have. They're not even writings that correspond precisely to specific sources that scholars posit as underlying the Pentateuch. But they do show clearly the use of sources by those who compose these works. There's also implicit evidence. And we can note in this category different names for God and for places. Does a passage refer to God as Yahweh? Does it refer to simply use the term God? Does it refer to the mountain where uh, Moses meets with God as Sinai or as Horeb? And so on and so forth. We have different accounts of the same event. And this is, again, a phenomenon that goes beyond the Pentateuch, but it's found within it. We have different explanations of the same name, the same custom. We have different theological emphases. And again, I can direct you to the lectures I have online about Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to look at one of the classic examples of this, right, where it seems as though there are different creation stories by different authors. There are also awkward breaks in the narrative in places, and there are stylistic differences, which again seem to suggest multiple authors. It's appropriate to ask, when thinking about things like the different ways of referring to God, whether that necessarily indicates separate authors. The same people in the same hymn book or in the same prayer can address God as Father, as Lord, as God, and in any number of other ways. And so, what does that really tell us? But I think it's important to note and very fortunate that we actually have some clear evidence within the Bible for a different preference among different constituencies in ancient Israel regarding how to refer to God and how to address God. Who these constituencies were, whether it was the northern kingdom of Israel versus the southern kingdom of Judah, whether it was some other groupings, it's hard to say. But that there were such groups seems to me to be clearly indicated when we consider Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 side by side. These are basically the same psalm. Right? It's not simply that they are similar. These are two versions of the same psalm. And if we ask what is different, the only major difference is that one uses the divine name Yahweh, that's what's behind the use of the English Lord in capital letters, and one version doesn't. And it's hard to account for why there would be different versions of the same psalm with this as the only real difference between them, were it not the case that there were different groups that had different traditions about how to refer to God. And so, again, the evidence for positing different sources that may have told the same story but used different names for God and done things slightly differently, there's evidence within the Bible. It's not simply scholars coming with something from outside. There are also differences in other parts of the Bible. I put these cartoons up there, but those aren't the two different versions of the flood story that I have in mind. In the creation stories, one can see side by side two different accounts that use different ways of referring to God and have different emphases, and so on and so forth. In other texts, and the flood story is a classic example, you can pull on the strands of the divine names, the different lengths of time that the uh, flood is said to have lasted, whether it said that Noah brought two of every creature, or two of every creature, and seven of every clean creature, every clean animal, the ones that were used for sacrifice. The reason for that being that, you know, otherwise, as soon as Noah gets off the ark, offers sacrifice, that species that is used for sacrifice and food is extinct. Right? All of these things, the positing of different sources, this is not scholars coming to the text and trying to create difficulties. The text is difficult. If you've ever read a very literal translation of the Bible that doesn't smooth over difficulties, you'll know that there are difficulties, there are puzzles, there are things that don't seem to fit together. What scholars are doing when they posit the existence of underlying sources is they're trying to make sense of the text, and they're suggesting this as a way of doing so. If you don't find this explanation of how the text came to its present form, by all means come up with a better one. And the details of these um, source divisions, the details of the scholarly analysis, are things that are of ongoing debate. But the broad overview, that there are sources that were used, that there is editing that occurs,
there's a widespread consensus about. Let me just say tr what the traditional source division among scholars is. J denotes what's referred to as the Yahwist source, and that's because this was formulated in Germany, and so J is the first letter of Yahweh in the German spelling. But it helpfully reminds that um, it connects this text with the southern kingdom of Judah. E, known as the Elohist, right, preferring Elohim and associated with the northern kingdom. Uh, there's been a lot of dispute about this text as a separate source, simply because Elohim, as a word for God, is also used by those who used the divine name Yahweh. And so it's not clear whether one can actually separate out a separate source here. There's the priestly writer, uh, sometimes thought to be a separate source used by the final editor, sometimes thought to be the work of the final editor himself. And then Deuteronomy has its own style and perspective, and so is often listed separately. And if you want more information about these sources and where they're um, identified as being present in the text of the Pentateuch, you can find that information online. Uh, I won't go through other examples on this occasion. But they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so let me conclude with two pictures. And again, I found these online, various websites that address um, what's known as the documentary hypothesis, right? the view that one can detect the presence of earlier sources behind the Pentateuch. And if you ask why do people do this, one is, why do scholars do this? One reason is to make sense of puzzling aspects of the text, right? apparent discrepancies and things of that sort. The other is because of a historical interest. If we can only date the texts in their present form to the time of the exile or after the exile, that puts at least half a millennium between these texts and the events that are described in them. And in fact, you know, that's the case with the uh, works that are later than the Pentateuch. In the case of the Pentateuch, it's even more than that, right? um, getting closer to a millennium beforehand. And so with that amount of time having passed, we'd have to be skeptical that there's anything of any historical value at all, anything that tells us anything about pre-exilic Judah and Israel. The reason why historians feel that there are things that we can deduce about these ancient kingdoms in their earlier history is precisely because analysis of the text, close attention to detail, suggests that there are traditions embedded in it which go back to that earlier time in history. And so whether trying to make sense of the text in its present form or trying to get beyond the text to the earlier period that some of these traditions might stem from, source analysis is a crucial part of that. And so it doesn't seem as though one should simply accept the tradition that Moses was the author. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that the final four of these works dates from much later. And on the other hand, close investigation of the text itself points to um, particular texts that might have particular contexts and times in history that they can be associated with.